Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are beside mine, it is for you. 1415 read. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And God's people say amen. 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 You might can see that we are still studying. 2 Corinthians chapters 4, 5, 6, and 7. As you may know by now, if you have heard even just a few of these sermons, that 2 Corinthians is an extremely personal letter in which Paul the Apostle wrote to the church in the city of Corinth because of numerous reasons. Number one, the church in Corinth. It was a collection of believers who Paul had to address often. And you go back and read the first letter, which is really the second letter. He called them carnal, babes in Christ. He said, I cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual men, but as unto carnal, as unto babes in Christ. So in light of this, they often needed to be corrected they often need to be addressed normally in forms of criticism, correction, and instruction. In other words, the normal things you have to do with a child. Amen. Because of the many different problems that were present in this church. Corinth was in essence a problem church for Paul with many different negative spiritual issues. 
which require he address them often. And he sometimes had to address these things in a harsh manner. And so this was the reason why Paul wrote this second letter to the Corinthians. One of the major problems in the church in Corinth was that it had been invaded by false teachers who were teaching false doctrine. And this caused much spiritual confusion, corruption, and chaos in this church, which turned them away, or which turned the Corinthian believers away from the simplicity which is in Christ. And so Paul had to address these false teachers and false doctrines that they were teaching. And so this also was a reason why Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. And then three, Paul had just been through a severe persecution. And it was during this persecution the Spirit of God stirred Paul's mind, stirred Paul's thinking to be refined or to get a better grasp, a better grip concerning many of the essentials of the Christian faith. And it is these things Paul incorporated into this letter that we call 2 Corinthians. One of these areas concerned the conscious existence of Christians after they die. In 2 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit through Paul revealed there are really two stages of existence for believers after they leave this world through death. The first stage consists of the fact that the moment a believer dies, his or her conscious soul departs their now dead body and is ushered into the conscious presence of the Lord. It is a consciousness outside of the body. Nevertheless, it is a real consciousness which is just as real as all of us are conscious this morning. Uh, you, you, you realize you're, you are in uh, the Word of God Community Church and you are listening or tuning out the sermon being preached <laughs> by Dr. Lloyd D. Kinlow II. The point is, it is a consciousness just as you are conscious of what is going on around you right now, yet it is outside of the body. And as we read through the scriptures, the consciousness it sees, it feels, it remembers, it does everything except what these bodies can do. It communicates, and so there is a real conscious existence in the presence of Jesus after the believer dies, and the Bible looks upon this as a place of conscious rest. However, this is not our final state. For there is another stage based on, upon the return of Christ to this earth for his bride, the church. When Christ returns, 2 Corinthians uh, 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 chapter 4, the dead in Christ will be raised from the dead in a glorified body just like the one Jesus had after he rose from the dead. And it is in this glorified body that the soul of the Christian, which had been in the conscious presence of the Lord, it will be reunited into his or her glorified body. Amen. And it is in these glorified bodies that believers will exist forever in a place the Bible calls the new heaven and the new earth where God will dwell among men. So if you want to know what sort of what it's going to be like, I don't think we can really, really get a grasp upon it. I mean, look at Jesus in, in, after he rose from the dead. He was able to uh, uh, eat, drink, um, touch, feel. He told the disciples, handle me, see, touch me. You know, flesh and bones does not have, uh, you know, a spirit does not have flesh and bone. And so he could make a fire. And, uh, you know, he had that uh, dinner of royal fish and honeycomb waiting for them on the shore. But yet he could vanish out of their sight. And appeared as though he would send back and forth to heaven at will. And so the new heaven and the new earth, I, I hope I can explain this correctly. In this period of time, there will be a 
a connection between heaven and earth. And so it's all, it'll be almost like two sides to the same coin. In other words, one does not exist apart from another. And so we'll have access in the new earth and access in the new heaven. Whatever that will be and whatever that will consist of, uh, you will be in a glorified body. Just like the one Jesus had after he rose from the dead. And this is our final state and it will be a place where God dwells among men. Amen. Now in this letter or epistle of 2 Corinthians, Paul also informed the believers in Corinth that when they experience the first stage of their existence after they die, in a conscious yet bodiless state before the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be judged for their works as a believer to determine the rewards or losses they will experience in the eternity to come. This will not be a judgment to determine salvation because that judgment has already occurred in Christ upon the cross. Amen. So that judgment for us has already been settled and God judged our sins in Christ on the cross where he bore our sins in his body. He was, he was wounded for us. He was chastened for us by his stripes. We are healed. And, and, and God laid his stripes upon Jesus in behalf of us. And when the Lord cried out from the cross, it is finished. Our judgment as far as our sin and salvation, it was complete. Amen. So this judgment that we will all face after we leave these bodies and come before the Lord, it does not determine salvation, but it does make an assessment of your Christian life. Mm -hmm. wow. And the Lord will recompense you with either reward or loss. And this will be your existence in the eternity to come. It's almost what we call paradoxical. Uh, things seem to contradict one another, but they really don't, but they are both, both true. We are, and you can be in rest and uh, experience reward, be in rest and suffer loss in the new heaven and the new earth and possess many crowns for how you live your Christian life, but also in, in the heaven and earth and yet suffer loss. This is what the Bible teaches. It lets us know what we do in this light, it does count. Because we're going to give an account before God. So last Sunday we saw the covenant to all stand before the Lord to give an account of our Christian lives. To be recompensed. We have a sobering, reverential fear of the Lord. Because we know on this day, the Lord will give to every believer exactly what they deserve. Nothing more nothing less. So you won't, you won't stand before the Lord on that day and work a con job on him. You won't stand before him on that day and convince him that you really did mean to, to work for the Lord during your time on the earth, but you just had so much going on. You just didn't have time, Lord. Uh, generally, we have time to get done everything we think is important. So we find a way to get it done. We find a way to do it. If it's important to us, we get it done. And so we'll give an account and they'll reward us. Nothing more, nothing less. What you earn as far as rewards in this Christian life, that's what you get. And the Bible is very plain. There will be some who suffer loss, yet they will be saved. Yes. It is because of this judgment of believers, Paul said, he constantly persuaded believers to be faithful in the work of the Lord, in doctrine and also in behavior, or be faithful in what you believe and how you practice what you believe because we're all going to give an account as we stand before the Lord. As Paul persuaded men to be faithful to the Lord in doctrine and deed, this is how he appeared before the Lord. He appeared before the Lord as one who was constantly encouraging believers. Live for the Lord now. 
because you are going to give an account. He appeared as one like this before the Lord. And this is how Paul wanted to be seen in the conscience of the Corinthians. In other words, he wanted the Corinthians to understand that all that he did towards them in his corrupt, in his instruction, in his correction, and in his rebuke, everything he wished to them, it was in order that they understood that, listen, he's trying to help us stand before the Lord and be recompensed in a good way. As we hear the Lord say, well done. Faith over a few things, I'm going to make you ruler over many. And so Paul did not remind the Corinthians of the fear of the Lord in light of the coming judgment in order to put themselves or put himself in a favorable light before them, he said. He said, I'm not doing this to make myself look good to you. He said, I'm giving you a, 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 a reason to be proud of us in a good sense, in a dignified sense. In other words, the false teachers were trying to manipulate them for financial and material gain. He said, but I'm, I'm trying to help you gain eternally. He says, this is the reason for you to be proud of us. I'm giving you a reason to be proud of us because, you know, we are trying to prepare you for the eternity to come. And he said he also ministered like this before them. Um, in order to give an answer to the false teachers who took pride in things for appearance sake rather than for the sake of the heart. And so there were some that denigrated Paul and, you know, they said he's not an attractive guy. Um, his speech is not sophisticated. Um, he's always sick. Every time you turn around, you're in jail. And so they were concerned with the parents' sake. You know, he, he, didn't, he didn't look the part. See, Paul would never be invited to, I'm using Brother Aiden's word, mega mess. I said, Lord, look at my brother that put out on the net. Amen. Mega mess 2015. Paul would never get invited to mega mess because he wasn't about mess. They, they would, let me move on, amen. I don't even think they didn't like Jesus because he plied a whip full of cords <laughs> and run everybody up out of there. And so there were some that were carried away with appearance. So Paul said, I'm teaching you what I teach you, not because it, it looks good, but I, I'm dealing with the heart. I want my heart to be right before God, and I want yours to be right before God. And you stand before the Lord, Amen. And so he says, this is what you tell these false teachers. Now, in the verses we're going to look at this morning, Paul continues to discuss his behavior as an apostle. And why he always persuaded men, live for the Lord, persuaded Christians, live for the Lord. Why? You're going to give an account. You're going to be recompensed for what you do in the body, whether good or bad. He continues to explain his behavior in doing this act. Notice verse 13, Paul says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of a sound mind, it is for you. Let me say it again. Paul says, if, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of a sound mind, it is for you. First of all, the first word in 13, the word for, is the Greek word guard. Guard is a conjunction. It can also be translated by, uh, probably better for us by the word because. And it is the word which links what we just spoken in verse 12 with 13. So verse 12, I'm sorry, verse 13 is because of what was said in 12. 13 is because of what was said in 12. Therefore, in order to understand what Paul is saying in verse 13, we go back to verse 12. In verse 12, Paul talked about the Corinthians being proud of him. He giving them an answer to those who took pride in appearance rather than what was in the heart. And as we saw last Sunday, Paul was no doubt making a contrast between himself and the false teachers who had invaded the church in Corinth and contaminated them with false teaching and false doctrine. Therefore, right after Paul speaks of the Corinthians being proud of him, in order to give an answer to those who took pride in appearance rather than what was in the heart, he says, because... 
We're doing this because if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of a sound mind, it is for you. In other words, we can read 12 and 13 like this. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart because if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And we are of sound mind, it is for you. The terminology Paul uses there beside ourselves. It's the Greek word existamai, and it literally means to be out of one's mind. It means to be insane. We would say crazy. Or some other terminology. Based on Paul's use of this word, it appeared the false teachers who had invaded the church in Corinth. They had told the Corinthians, you know what, Paul is out of his mind. He's crazy. They said Paul is out of his mind, and those who did ministry with him, they were also insane. Or they're saying Paul and those women, all those guys are beside themselves. They're all mentally ill. They're all insane. Now, you know, I don't have a lot of time to spend here, but you know, um, you need to understand that those caught up in the false doctrine, sound doctrine sounds crazy Amen. to them. Amen. Amen. Now, Paul is the most lucid guy on record. Yeah. And they said, this dude's crazy. See, when you're caught up in the false doctrine and you're following the false teaching, what is sound sounds insane to you. Let me move on. And so they were telling everybody in the church of Grand Paul was crazy that Paul was star raving mad. In a manner of speaking, Paul responded to the accusation by saying, well, if we are insane and, and, and we have been labeled, it's for God. But if we are sound, it is for you. In an almost sarcastic way, Paul is admitting to being out of his mind. But he is out of his mind for God. He is insane for God. But on the other hand, he and those he ministered to, uh, uh, he and those who ministered with him, they were sound toward the Corinthians. They were out of their minds for God, but sound toward the Corinthians. Insane for God, but in, uh, sound towards others. The word sound is a Greek word, sophrenio. It means to be of sound mind, as evidenced by one's thinking, how one behaves, how one speaks, one's thought processes, how one contemplates, how one meditates. It also means one who has serious speech. So Paul says, we're crazy for God, but when we deal with you, we are totally sane. We are coherent. We are lucid. Uh, what we say makes sense. We are great thinkers for the Lord. We meditate upon the Lord. In our speech in behalf of God, it is serious speech. And it is sound towards you. Now, what Paul is talking about is his obedience to the word of Jesus in Matthew 22, 37, by loving God with one's mind. The text says that he, Jesus, said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. That's the emotion. But he also says, and with all your mind. When Paul said he was of sound mind to the Corinthians, he was really talking about loving God with one mind. See, when you love God with your mind, you'll be sound towards others. Yeah. The word mind there is a Greek word, the annoyer. It means the exercise of one's intellectual faculties. That's your brain. Exercising your brain towards God. Loving the Lord with your thinking processes. 
loving God with your contemplation and loving God with your med meditation upon the things of God. Loving God with your mind and is evidenced by when you speak, it is a serious speech for the Lord. It is not frivolous. It isn't something ridiculous. But it is sound. See, this is what happens when you love the Lord with your mind. Therefore, Jesus says, we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and soul. That's the emotional act of worshiping God. Now, I didn't say emotionalism. <laughs> but we, we, we worship God with emotions. And so there's nothing wrong with saying praise the Lord. There's nothing wrong with saying amen. There's nothing wrong with raising your hand. There's nothing wrong with clapping. As long as it doesn't go over into emotionalism. Amen. Now, see, emotionalism is when you come to church and you act like you are out of your mind up in here. Amen. <laughs> now, now, am I in the house today? Oh, yeah. See, we are emotional for the Lord, but we don't practice. When you put that ism on it, it's a problem. We have great emotions for the Lord, but we don't practice emotionalism. And so we do worship the Lord with our emotions, but we also love the Lord with our mind. We, uh, we love the Lord with the exercise of our intellect and our thinking. See, if we love the Lord with our minds, our intellect, and our thinking, if this will manifest itself in the way we behave and the way we speak. And it will lead to the proper emotional response and praise to God. The mind or intellect being saturated with the knowledge of God through his word, it will or it should supersede the emotional aspect of our relationship with God. You can't respond to God right until you hear from God right. Amen. Amen. And you hear from God in your mind. Let me say it again. You, you can't respond from God with the right emotions unless you hear from God first. Amen. And know what God requires of you. And know who God is. And know what God has done. You can't properly respond to God Unless you know God is the sovereign God of the universe. God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He knows all things. He is omnipresent. He is everything at the same time. God is loving. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is good. God is long suffering. But God is also a consuming fire. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. A living God who is angry with the wicked every day. You cannot respond to God with the right emotion unless you love the Lord your God first with all of your mind. All of your intellect, all of your thinking. When you love the Lord with your mind, it'll bring forth the proper emotional response towards God. Amen. But I'm not finished. It'll also bring about sobriety Amen. towards others. Amen. Paul was insane for God. He was out of his mind for God. But his thinking, his behavior, his speech was never insane or indicative of one being out of his mind as he dealt with the Corinthians and others. See, Paul was contrasting his sound thinking, speaking, and behavior when it came to the things of God in contrast to the insane, frenzy, foolish thinking, behavior, and speaking which characterized the false teachers of his day. The same men were saying, Paul's crazy. Paul said, no, I'm not. He told him, my, my knowledge is not contemptible. He said, I might not speak well. He said, but you can't knock my knowledge. I know what I'm talking about. So he says, when I deal with people, I'm sound. The false teachers were insane. <laughs> if I have time to deal with it, and I don't, you know, and I keep saying this over and over and over, and I don't think some believe it, but in the early church, the infant church, the pagans went to the temple and acted a fool. The Christians came to church and acted like they had some sense. <laughs> There was sobriety in worship because they feared God. Also, God wanted there to be a distinction between how his folks worship him 
and how the devil's people worship false gods. And so don't tell me God had the Christians acting just like those in the temple of Aphrodite. Frenzy, out of control, saying stuff that don't make sense, acting in a way where people thought you were literally out of your mind. There was a clear distinction. And this is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as he is in all the churches of the saints. Last verse in that chapter says, therefore, that all things be done, what, decently and in order. Now, where I grew up, the more disorderly you were, the more they said you was full of the spirit. Somebody is wrong, you can't be God, amen. So Paul says you can't have church service and the unlearned or the unsaved look at you and say people are out of your minds. We should not conduct ourselves in here like that. So I keep saying that because some of y'all want to know why I refuse to let us go to an extreme. We don't want to have, we don't want to have spiritual dry ride and just sit up there like this. Somebody say amen. You looking around to see who's that? <laughs> you can't say it up in here. Who can't say saying amen up in here? Who can't be serving God? You can't be saying it is so God. It is true. That's what the word amen means. It's a response to truth. Amen. It means it is so. It is true. So we don't want to be that. To that extreme. On the other extreme, you know, we 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 you know we don't want to be hanging out the chandelier. Amen. <laughs> You know, broad jumping pews and all this kind of stuff. Just running around acting crazy, somebody on the floor. Hey, Amen. I can't get up. We don't do carpet time over here. Get up. Unless you sit and just can't get up. And we'll pray for you while we call the ambulance. Amen. Paul says we are crazy for God, but sound towards you. Several points I want to make that are applicable to today based on this truth. They are number one. If a person is deep into the Lord and saying for God, really a crazy about Jesus, this will manifest itself in soundness of mind. That almost sounds like a contradiction, don't it? If you're crazy about God, it'll manifest itself in soundness of mind towards others. Soundness of mind, soundness of intellect in the things of God, sober, dignified behavior. You know, Paul told the elder men in the church, I want you to, when you go to church, he said, I want you to act dignified. Yeah. So we older men, we need to come up in here dignified. In other words, act like me. Amen. Amen. Dignified in speaking for the Lord, dignified in living for the Lord. In other words, if you are crazy for God, you'll make sense in your thinking, your behavior, and in your speech. Yes. Amen. Insanity for God produces a sound mind toward men, women, and children. Number two, if a person claims to be crazy for the Lord, but at the same time they speak much foolishness in the name of the Lord. Act like they're out of their minds in church. They are so happy in the Lord they have no control of themselves. In the church service or in their personal lives, something else is going on. It's not a true insanity for God. Something else is going on, but whatever it is, it is not because they are just crazy about Jesus. Because that produces soundness of mind towards others. What is going on is either ignorance of the things of God, or a misunderstanding of the things of God, or they have had a constant bad diet, a constant diet of bad teaching, bad doctrine, or they have a spirit other than the Holy Spirit, it's either in them or acting upon them. Or there just may be some clinical issues that need to be addressed in a clinical setting. Why is this is true? It is true because when one is beside themselves for God, it produces soberness and soundness towards others. Amen? Amen. Number three, men who occupy the office of pastor or sold out for God or insane for God will always appear before the congregation and, and, and others 
as one of a sound theological mind, sound theological speech, sound godly behavior. If I'm out of my mind for God, I need to be up here making sense to you. Amen. Men who aren't saying to God, beside themselves towards God, will never speak nor act like a raving lunatic in or out of the church setting. And we move on. Men who claim to be zealous and insane towards God or have, have basked in the presence, power, and Shekinah glory of God. You got guys saying, I'm basking in the Shekinah glory. I've done it. I'm basking in the Shekinah glory of God. And we know that's not, that's not true because the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God came over here to kill you. Remember, Moses came down from the mountain. He just had a little bit that was still on his face. And as my brother Chris Wood said, they had to cover his head with a sack. Amen. <laughs> They couldn't, they couldn't take it. They said, Mo, here, get, 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 you know, get covered, get it. We can't, we know, we'll die. But we got guys I'm basking in the hook. You ain't done nothing, amen. <laughs> but when you hear people talk about all this stuff, but they say in, insane things from the pulpit, you know it's not God. Because craziness for God produces soundness yeah. Yeah. towards others. Amen? Amen. Amen. amen and amen. amen. So if you're really crazy about God, you won't come out and say, you know, God, he don't know everything. He don't even know when people die until you get the memo. <laughs> now see, that's insane. Amen. Amen. How can God not know that you die? Because the moment you die, you're in the presence of the Lord. Does that make sense? If you are immediately in the presence of the Lord, that sounds like he knows you died. I mean, is, that, is this reasonable? Am I talking, to, you know, but, but you know, I'm seeing folks shout. Lord, he don't know what I thought. Does that make sense to you? God don't know everything. Ah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Our God is almost omnipotent. Ah, thank you, Jesus. He knows a lot, but not everything. Ah, shout. See, that's craziness. <laughs> Crazy for God says, listen. Our God is an awesome God. Yes. Our God is all, he's omnipotent. There is nothing too hard for God. Yes. Yes. God speaks things ex nihilo. He speaks things that were not even in existence. He speaks the word and they just be. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. The Hebrew says, light be. See, this is God. Our God is omniscient. He says, I know everything from the beginning to end. He said, I know it all. I know everything from the beginning to the end. He said, there is no other God beside me. God says, listen, I, I'm the Lord and I live forever. He says, if I wet my glittering sword and let it sink into some flesh, what are you going to do? He said, I wound, I heal, I kill, I make alive, I make well. And he says, there is none that can deliver anybody from my hand. This is the God that we serve. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it all makes sense to you. We serve a great God. We serve a wonderful, great, infinite Savior. Amen. And there's no, there was nothing too hard for him when he walked the earth, and there's nothing too hard for him right now. Walking on water was not a problem for him. Raising the dead was not a problem for him. Taking a few fish and a few loaves of bread and being thousand, that was not a problem for Jesus. Yeah. Even being killed was not a problem because he said, if you kill me in three days, I'll take it back. Yeah. If I'm crazy about God, what I say up here ought to make sense to you. Amen. Whether you get happy and shout of it, or get mad. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm just going to go with number five, and I'm going to move on. I have eight, but I'll, I'll stop at five. If we come to church and testify that I've heard some doing the past day, I don't mind acting ugly for Jesus. Well, that's a contradiction there. Because if you're crazy about Jesus, it'll come out as same sanity. Soundness to others. If we are beside ourselves, if we are out of our minds, Paul says, it is for God. If we are sound, if, if we are sound, it is for you. Amen. 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 I have a few more, but I'm going to stop right there because I might not be able to take any more of that. Amen. <laughs> see, because this, this is not what you see today. When you turn on TV, you see TV religion is confusion. 
is stuff that's just utterly ridiculous. And you ought to be ashamed of yourself for following some of this charlatanism out here. Yeah. It, it, it's, just, it's just a shame before you say you know Jesus and you can't get this stuff straight. Amen. Teach us. Preach, Pastor. I got to move on. For the love of Christ controls us. <coughs> Paul uses the same conjunction. By saying for the love of God controls us, it means because. Remember, it explains what was said in the previous verse. In verse 13, Paul just said, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are sound, if we are sound, it is for you. Because, because what? The love of Christ controls us. He says we are out of our minds for God, but saying toward you, because the love of Christ controls controls us, constrains us, compels us, shackles us down, yes. locks us up. The reason why Paul and those who minister with him were beside our mind toward the Corinthians was because of the love of Christ. The love of Christ controlled them. The word control there, it's a Greek word, suneko. It was the word used to describe some, someone who was in prison or the prisoner of others. It's an excellent word to describe how the love, the Lord's love for us controls. Because when you're in prison, you can't do whatever you want to do. Amen. No, when you're in jail, you, 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 you don't get to do what you want to do. Somebody controls your whole day. See, when you're in prison, you don't leave for 30 minutes to go get a Wendy's. <laughs> you don't leave for 30 minutes. Where are you going? Oh, I'm going to get a double uh, 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 Whopper or... Uh, What's that? A medium coat and a fry. My daughter knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't do that kind of stuff. I'm going to Starbucks. Tell them the ward. Where are you going? I'm going to get a latte. <laughs> I'll be right back. You want one? <laughs> See, when you're in prison, somebody controls everything. Man. Well, Paul said, when he said the love, the love of Christ controls us, what he means is. Christ's love for us literally has us in a prison. Therefore, he controls us. Yes. And this is why we are of a sober mind towards yes. you. Yes. And once again, I believe Paul is contrasting himself as a true apostle of the Lord against those who claim to be apostles, but they were not. And it is these men who had invaded the church in Corinth. God's people were of soundness of mind and intellect towards others because Jesus' love for them controls them, constrains them, <coughs> compels them not to think, act, or speak in an unsound or confusing manner. Now, this particular aspect of our relationship with the Lord is not dependent upon us. Amen. Because it is his love Amen. that constrains or controls us. Amen. You read this in the Greek, you know, knowing the word for Christ is Christos. Zehus Christos. But if you look at this in the Greek language, the word Christos there is not Christos, it's Christou. The ending Christou, it means the one who is Christou is the one who can possesses the love. See, we know what these Greek words mean by looking at the ending. And so, this is a love that belongs to Christ. It's not our love for him that controls us. It's his love for us that controls us. Now, Jesus cannot fail in his love, so when you get out of control, who is it? It's not him. He never fails in his love. And his love controls us. If we think, act, and behave like pagans who are out of control in their so-called worship or in their personal lives, it is not because God don't love us, but it's because something is wrong with us. Amen? Amen. His love constrains us, yeah. compels us, to do right, to think right, and to act right. 
So when I see insanity in the church, I know it's not the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's somebody else or something else that works some flesh. A spirit. Probably a combination of the two, because normally you have one. Y'all with me today? Yeah. Normally when you got a whole lot of flesh, it's a demon hanging around saying, yeah, I can use it in today. When you get a whole lot of you, flesh, take over, man. You, you, you rest assured, the demon ain't in you, but he, 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 he egging you on, amen. Some of you, you've heard, you've heard a little whisper in your ear, haven't you? Now, come on. You know, you want to do something you know it's not right. Haven't you heard the whisper? Y'all? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Say, yeah, yeah. Good. Good. Get a toe. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Seriously, it's, 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 it, and, and let's keep it real. Let's be honest. It's a foreign voice. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. It's a whisper, but you know it's it's a it's a foreign voice. Now, it, the demons will talk to you. And you are extremely susceptible to them when you are into a whole lot of you. Flesh. But the love of Christ controls us. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm almost done. For the love of Christ controls us. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Notice Paul by the Spirit of God says, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again. The reason why Paul said the love of Christ controls us is because the one man Christ died for all, therefore all died. What is Paul by the Spirit of God talking about in this portion of verse 14? What he is saying is, somehow, or in some kind of way beyond our comprehension. When God was working out our salvation through Christ on the cross, when Jesus died, those of us who are saved, when he died, we did also. We died in the spiritual sense. And what it means is the old sinful life he used to live with much, with much pleasure, it died when Jesus died on the cross for sin. This is why when you come to know Christ as Savior, things change. Because you died with Jesus on the cross. And if you die with him, you can no longer live for you. In the house, but, uh, went to a funeral this past week. A friend of the family, and he's known me since I was born, but he's known my father for probably about 60 years. And um, he came to know the Lord when he was very, very sick. And in a nursing home. And I wish they'd open up words for people to give a few words because I, I talked to this gentleman years ago and he called me David. David, don't worry. He said, I am not going to enter the East Gate furnace. He said, somewhere along the line. He said, I know this is right. Whenever he gets scared, he talk, called me up talking about revelation. I'm scared. But he came to know the Lord. And when he came to know the Lord in the, in the nursing home, I guess he was a problem, uh, what do they call them now? Clients, patients, whatever. So politically correct, now I know what they call folks. Are you a patient or a client? Or what else? What, what you know, they call them inmates, clients, now. So I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm confused. 
then he made a client. You in jail. <laughs> you know, ain't no client. <laughs> Clients are purchasing goods and services. <laughs> You've been locked down. Amen. <laughs> but he said he was a problem patient. When nurses would come in to help him, he would talk about them, curse them out. They'd come in to try to clean them up. He'd just call, call, curse them out, talk. Then they'd try to help him, and he'd just give them a hard time. Came to know the Lord, and he called his son-in-law into the room one day. He says, something is happening to me. He says, I feel horrible now when I, when I don't treat the nurses right. I feel horrible when I don't treat the staff right. He said, what's happening to me? I know what happened to him. See, the old man died for Jesus. Put him to death. And things began to change. We'll get it next week. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passing away. All things becoming new. We died with him. Amen. Put us to death with him. This life we used to live, it's, it's, he, he killed it. He killed it with yeah. Jesus on the cross. And that's why we cannot be out of control. <laughs> Notice, then Paul says, by the Spirit of God, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that, who, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves. But for him who died and rose again. The reason why Paul says the love of Christ controls us is because the one man Christ died for all and therefore all died. And so, you know, once again, he continues by saying, you know, uh, it says he died for us. We died in him. And then he says, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Uh, Christ died for you. He died in your behalf. In order that you would no longer live for yourself, but for him. Now you have to understand, this is the exact opposite of how false teachers live. They, don't, they live for themselves. The false prophet is all about himself. Make no mistake about it. It's all about me. It's about my cheddar and money. It's about my cash. It's about my diamonds. It's about my jewelry. It's about my houses. It's about my $65 million jet I need. It's about my clothes. You know, I don't want nothing off the rack. Don't y'all buy me anything because you can't afford what I wear. The false, the false teacher is all about himself. I want my money. I want it now. I'm about this. I'm about that. If I wanted any of y'all's wives, I can have them. And I'll get quiet on you. The false teacher is always about himself. And this is the way these men were who had invaded Corinthians with false teachers. And Paul says, listen, Christ died for us. He died on our behalf in order that we would no longer live for ourselves. Amen. But for him. And what Paul is doing, he's cutting the legs out from underneath these false teachers. Yes. Yes. I wish I had time to go through the whole book, but I can't. 2 Corinthians 11, 12, and 15. Paul says, and I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. False teachers are always about themselves. Unsaved folks are always about themselves. So when you come to church and it's your way or no way, you better check your religion out. Amen. Check your salvation out. Because we no longer live for ourselves. Amen. We live for him. Amen. Amen. It's no longer all for me. You know, some folks is like that. We order a pizza, it's got to be what you want. And we have a church fellowship. <laughs> You're putting in the order. 
ain't eating unless it's what you still eating. Them? Yeah. <laughs> I don't care what kind of story y'all get, as long as you get some orange. I like orange. People, people do this. I like, I want orange, so I don't, I don't like that. I ain't come to Belgium, I don't like the food. Stuff like that. See, when you get saved, you no longer live for yourself, but you live for the one who died and rose in your behalf. Amen. And amen. False teachers, they're selfish. It's all about them. They want to live either like the Queen of England and demand obedience like the mentally insane dictator of North Korea, Kim, Kim Jong-un, who recently executed his uncle for getting out of line or questioning him about his weird behavior. See, that's the false teacher. It's about me. I live like a king. You obey me. Don't ask why. When I tell you to jump, just ask how high. That's not the way we do it. We live for the one who died and rose in our behalf. In other words, we are no longer selfish, but we are selfless. Yes. We give ourselves to God, yes. and it will manifest itself in us giving ourselves to others. Amen? Yes. I'm done. Let's, let's pray. I'm done. I'm done. Heavenly Father, Lord, I truly thank you for the word of God today. Lord, help us as we really strive to rightly divide the word of truth and handle the word of God accurately. Lord, I pray that we've heard the word of God.